Okay, so good afternoon. I am Anto Budiarjo. Welcome to Monday Live. This is something that we do every Monday afternoon at 3 p.m. Eastern to discuss the advances in smart buildings and figure out where it's headed. Um, list of uh, panelists uh, are uh, on mondaylive.org. Um, most important thing uh, for me to note is the views here are personal, not of any company or organization. Um, and uh, please do post your questions and comments and um, other sort of uh, relevant uh, uh, um, things on the chat. Uh, and as a reminder, this slide deck is available on mondaylive.org, the, the homepage of that. Um, our topic uh, this month, and this is the last um, uh, Monday of, uh, of April, is value in context. Our agenda today, as always, uh, news and trends, chit chat, what's going on. And then we really want to talk about the value of context itself. So um, just sort of a tweak of one word, um, and uh, we'll, we'll explain what that means in, in a bit. But before we get into that, um, hand over to uh, Ken. What's going on, Ken? Thanks, Anto. Uh, we've got our uh, April issue. We're just finishing that up. Uh, reinvention, reconfiguration, and forced evolution. Uh, all about change and how we uh, how we exchange the information about change. And our May issue, we're uh, we're, we're following your lead on the uh, value enabling value by improving infrastructure. And uh, what I've kind of come to the conclusion there is that we spend an awful lot of time uh, trying to uh, sell our infrastructure uh, and confusing the hell out of people. And I think we need to focus a lot more on what is the value we provide with our infrastructure. And we're starting to see uh, kind of some trends that are heading that way. And I think that's a, a good direction. Um, our infrastructure, I think, is what we all do, and it's all really important to each of us. But uh, when we try to talk to the general public about it, I think they kind of glaze over. Uh, uh, and it gets even more confusing every day kind of thing. So uh, uh, after been, being in the industry for a long time, it, uh, it's not getting any clearer in my mind. So uh, I think we need to focus back on what it is, uh, these wonderful technologies of ours, what value they enable and uh, we need to kind of focus on that uh real pleased uh got our first article in for our, our may issue and uh it's by one of our uh, contributing editors uh, forever uh and uh, of course the grid god of the past uh who's retired and turned artist uh, jack mcgowan uh, and uh, jack gives us this uh this article and with a pitch with a picture and I think uh, maybe we all have to start heading that direction of adding a little better uh, pictures to our articles that uh, kind of capture uh, capture the value thoughts uh, better than all of the technologies. He calls it block energy by the sea and uh, we were we were chatting and uh, I challenged him to uh, to that he had to had to take his new uh, his new uh, vocation of being a painter and uh, and tie it into his past. So uh, this is his uh, try at it. And he's showing us here a project that he's part of in uh, Tampa, Florida. And it's uh, <clears throat> block energy and where the houses all interact and uh, use green energy. And uh, he's uh, he's tried to capture that in, uh, in his pictures. Uh, also mentioned that Jack and I uh, probably have a combination of like a hundred years uh, in this automation industry. So uh, we've, we've kind of seen a lot of it come and go and uh, it's ever changing and uh, exciting, but I think we have to uh, focus, focus on the value uh, that our infrastructures provide. We're in the infrastructure business, but it's hard to sell infrastructure if you don't understand why it's there. Back to you, Anto. When you say infrastructure, you're talking about the infrastructure within the building, meaning network and, and equipment and systems. Is that what yeah, you mean? Yeah, I kind, of, I, I kind of see us all as infrastructure providers. I mean, we provide automation systems. We provide, uh, uh, you know, or we provide services that, uh, that make this stuff go. But we don't, we, we sometimes, somehow we somehow get disconnected from the actual value that that is providing. I think we have to tell that value story a lot stronger than we have been. 
You know, uh, te technology as a service to tasks or is another way of describing infrastructure, uh, you know, to, to avoid the possible confusion, but technology infrastructure, yes. But I think it's easier for people to understand the value. Um, like for example, in Jack's picture, the value is that we're, that he's switching over to ulterior, uh, sorry, alternative energy. And uh, basically also the idea of, of of block energy. In fact, all the houses on the block chipping in to come up. Who's got the biggest roof? I've got a big solar roof. I can actually, uh, I can actually produce more solar than I can use, so I can sell it. Somebody might be on the windy end of the block. Uh, it's just sort of moving that back into a uh, uh, a smaller microgrid and uh, just uh, just some of that stuff evolving. That's all pretty complex, except if you kind of just show it in a green light uh, that people can kind of understand that. And then they start asking the questions, how are you doing that? Once they start asking the questions, how are we doing it? I think we can respond well, but I think sometimes we miss the opportunity of, of starting that conversation. Okay. So right, let's, let, me, let me jump in though, Ken. I, I love this for two reasons. One of which is perfect for today's call, but I also love the idea of telling a story, right? So it's, it helps to tell the story, so that's nice. And then really what this also does is it starts to create the context for why you would even do this, which is a perfect feed into today's. So yeah, nice one. Great, thank you. I thought um, Jack was done and retired altogether. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> John, you're hoping that you. me too, <laughs> but I'm back too. Yes. <laughs> you yeah, never saw in this industry. <laughs> they won't let you. <laughs> so I, I, I picked two uh, stories that I've seen recently that I thought I would uh, share. Um, one we we mentioned briefly, but I uh, didn't have the exhibits, which is you know um, the lobbyists are winning. And a really interesting article because it basically, uh, I'll try to summarize a thought from it, not the whole article, but, you know, um, I think I said, do you guys belong to the Chamber of Commerce, right? And some of you do. Great. We belong to the Chamber of Commerce. We think they're helping our business. Well, they're actively lobbying against many uh, programs that would help support um, moving towards um, alternative energy, reducing carbon footprint, et cetera. So they're a big lobbying organization, but of course it sounds like they have a very blunt instrument as far as it might be helping uh, those of us who are trying to see regulation develop, et cetera. So that's the article I mentioned briefly. Um, and the other one on the other side of it is uh, positive effects of green bonds uh, enabling um, property owners, commercial real estate owners to be able to finance projects that have larger upfront capital costs, right? Which we, we talk about a lot because as much as you may want to move to an as a service model, sometimes that's simply not possible because the larger upfront capital costs of equipment, but not just the capital costs of equipment, but the installation costs, right? You could give away the hardware or software, but you're not going to give away the systems integration work that might be 10x that. So those are two stories I thought were um, relevant um, to, you know, the conversations we're having. Great. Thank you. Um, I came up with a couple of things. Um, one, uh, the first on the left is an article about climate change and real estate um, in the New York Times. I thought that was kind of an interesting, um, uh, just a, an interesting conversation, Not, nothing really specific, just... Uh, just how those two um, things are intersecting. Uh, and the one on the right is uh, also from IoT Analytics that I showed. Uh, I had a, another piece last week, if you recall, uh, in terms of the, 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 the global companies, um, what they're saying in their, in their um, uh, quarterly reports. This one's uh, specifically on uh, where all the different IoT technologies are. They call it the tech, IoT technology radar. I actually blew it up because it's hard to see. This is kind of a, a, a version of the Gartner hype cycle, but it doesn't talk about the hype. It just sort of talks about where everything is from the, from the context of far on the horizon all the way to fairly mature. And it's kind of just interesting to see where they think, where these um, um, analysts think uh, where everything is, where 
MQTT is, for example, it's kind of still um, halfway there and um, the, the, the other sort of different um, uh, topics that you see there. Um, and I'm getting to like this, uh, this site because uh, they, it kind of depicts really sort of complex uh, sets of data in a sort of a very sort of a consumable manner. So, so I thought that would be useful to share. Without any regard to uh, vertical markets, where any of this is applied, this particular chart, which I find really interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Are, are you saying that if it, if it were to take into account, then it, you'd have a different dimension of this potentially? Yeah, I, I think that that is the uh, elephant in the room on all IoT is the vertical market and channels to market that it attacks. Now we can talk about technology all day long, but uh, uh, how it gets applied, the ecosystem, and where it's going. Uh, otherwise, it's just a hmm. full of points on a screen. Okay. Uh, I would. I, I. I agree with my colleague, Mr. Lee, on that one wholeheartedly. Well said, Jim. So, so basically, he's saying it lacks context. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Well done. I, I think that's a good tie-in because some of these technologies could be in a totally different place with the context of something you're trying to do in the built environment. Right? Absolutely. Great. Uh, any other thoughts from yeah, the group? Quick one from me. Um, interesting, if you didn't read it, we had an interesting milestone this month here in the US. This First time that uh, wind power actually came in second as a supply of energy in the US behind natural gas, actually edging out coal and nuclear. Uh, really? First time, yeah. Wow. In uh, this back last uh, Tuesday, the 5th, it was recorded. <laughs> um, so, interesting milestone, I thought. Yeah, I hadn't seen that. Yeah. Very... This is the, across the US. Across, across the, the US, point. yeah. <laughs> uh, generated 2,000 gigawatt hours of electricity last Tuesday, uh, that Tuesday, the 5th. <laughs> um, edging out nuclear and coal. Natural gas is still the lead um, for supply. Okay. Anything else from anyone? Okay, so um, next month, we're going to have some fun. We're going to play <laughs> Family Feud. So the, I'll just give a little hint about what this is all about. Um, we've talked um, over the past two years about various sort of subjects, um, things like integration versus interoperability, edge versus cloud. These are kind of two things that it's not one or the other. It's not one versus the other. Uh, it's kind of um, the sort of nuances. And what we want to do over the course of May is actually pick up on a number of these sort of pairings of, of subjects and split this group into two and, and have a debate as to what is the plus and minuses of, of, of both. Not necessarily um, uh, looking to for a winner or anything, but just to have a discussion as to the comparison. So, any oh, come on, we, we, need, uh, we need scores. <laughs> What's the point of playing a game without a winner? We gotta we, measure debate performance, come on now. Oh, fair enough. Here's yours, Anto. Already, I'm giving it to you right now, Mike. Thank you, Mark. All right. So for today, um, for this month, value and context, and we're going to talk about value of context. Um, so what does that mean? Um, what does that mean? I apologize for Monty in the background here. Um, so what is context? Context is, I think we all know what the word context, we use it uh, a lot. Um, this is the definition of it, the circumstances that form the setting of an event statement or idea in terms of which it can be fully understood or assessed. And assess is, uh, is really sort of where I would place the, the word value uh, in, in the context of our conversation. So um, uh, one of the ways to, to, to have this conversation is if we take a few topics that, that we've talked about uh, a lot, analytics, cybersecurity, occupant health, and there are obviously lots of other topics that we could do the same. And so the discussion really is that if we take analytics, right, what, what is the value if the context is uh, the purpose, right? The, and what is the value if when the context is down here in exchange, for example? So just kind of just to get the juices going in terms of a conversation. 
and what does uh, cybersecurity look like from a, from a data perspective, et cetera, et cetera. So that's kind of one way that uh, we can have this conversation and we can branch off uh, in, in um, any way that uh, we, th we see uh, valuable. Uh, this is obviously context in the, in the scope of the smarter stack, but there are obviously other different contexts, uh, examples like a context of the physical context in, in a building versus um, um, other things, but anyway, I'll, 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 I'll shut up for now and um, let the, let the conversations begin. I think bring back that slide that you had up earlier, Anto, because I think that that was a really good observation from the team about this is a really good, yeah, because this yeah. is talks about technology without context, right? Mm -hmm. um, and to the point, so I think it's a good I think it was Bill who picked up on it. It was good representation of what we're trying to mean by context because you can talk about technology like this all day long and it probably has, you know, um, different roadmaps if you're applying this technology to, for example, electric vehicles, right? Or, you know, power station generation or, you know, what's, what's the applicability of, um, mm -hmm. you know, or it, data centers, you know, it, it has a different it'll have a different application of that. But I guess this chart is really talking about more technology from a maturity uh, perspective more than anything else, but. Yeah, let me, you guys mind if I tell just a very short parable of two fish swimming in the ocean and they're just swimming along two young fish and an older, wiser fish, the Mark Peacock fish comes up to them and says, hey boys, How's the water? And the fish just swim away, whatever. So a few kilometers away, the other, the other young fish looks at the other one and says, what's water? <laughs> so it's, you know, context is the driver for every action, whether we like it or not, whether it's just a cranky teenager or a tree growing in the forest or a purchaser ready to write a check to one of you guys. Context is decisive. Now, this is basic and 101, but if we don't remember that everything we do all day, everything we say is creating the context, which is going to drive actions, then we're just out there, a fish in water, clueless, talking about features and benefits, talk about how quickly you'll get something done, blah, 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 without actually giving the purchaser or anyone else in your life the context of why they should even be thinking about this. And, and so I think it's just brilliant that we'll take the idea of context, which is everywhere, and then put it under the heading of three specific topics that are important to the people on this call. Okay. Right, so you want to go so back just, to the stack picture? Yeah. Yeah. So I don't go ahead, uh, Anna. You had a comment. I was just going to say, so in that, in that, that's the other side of that coin, right, is, um, do we sometimes you sometimes people I've seen will extend beyond the context right so sometimes we fall foul of trying to do things or be things that we are out of context on right and and I don't know you, you can describe it like the bell curve right there are you know an IOT company who's really really well at IAQ sensors for argument sakes but then you go to their website and they talk about, you know, building analytics and you go, well, yeah, I get it. It's building analytics in the context of IAQ, but they leave that part off, you know, and then when do you drill down multiple places and you finally go, yes, it's building analytics related to um, IAQ. And sometimes I think we in collective, we, we, we tend to fall afoul of that. You know, you're kind of trying to read into what someone's doing and they leave the context off and they use the buzzwords. Yeah. You know, machine learning is another yeah. good example. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. along, those, along those lines, obviously if we're looking at what Anto has posted up here, let me, I want to say something about cybersecurity. So we in our industry have been talking about cybersecurity, the importance of it for, gosh, I don't know. I, when it really got hot, I think it was around 2012, but it's probably around 2010, there was beginning talk about cybersecurity in the built environment. So we've been talking about it 10, 11, 12 years or whatever it is. Although 
a lot has been done to to address this. You know, there still seems to be a hell of a lot of challenges, and those cha- one of the big challenges is I believe that people still do not take this seriously and that regardless of all the talk we've done, and I hope we as an industry have brought in the context of value as part of this, we've done, a, I think, an okay job on awareness, but where we're missing on the context of value is the justification. That's my statement with respect to pur- cybersecurity. The purpose layer? Uh, the purpose yes. layer? I mean, I it's don't think just, it's strong in the other layers. It's right. It's, it's yeah. Kind of yeah. It's just, again, as you know, we all do our daily businesses and we go to conferences and stuff. You know, you hear cyber every single day. Mm-hmm. But yet, again, is the value with respect to the context is, I, you know, have we done a good job? I say we have not. So and Mark, let me, one, let, okay. let me respond to that. I, I get what you're saying. I'm gonna give a different take on this. Not that it's true, but just, just for the time here. What if I say, you know what? I think people have heard it enough and they know it's important, but there's a context of complexity and cost that has them not do it or hold back or maybe not even do the overall project because it's got to be secure. And frankly, I don't know how to do it. So there could be, it could be that they're just not, the context on cyber is not there. It could also just be, oh my gosh, how could I ever do this? So complicated or so expensive. Not sure what the context is. Could be, could be yours. Could be something like that or a combination. So I was going to ask Steve, well, uh, because you, you've done a lot of work on the cybersecurity part of it, and especially as to re- how it relates to the to the stack. Do you want to uh, chime in? Yeah. So, well, I would say, picking up what both Mark and Bill were pointing to, the context is the environment in which we're trying to advocate for cybersecurity. And that environment is such that the problem is in many cases not understood nor believed. Okay. So that's the context in which we're trying to make a case that you need to secure these systems. So you've got an audience that is either knowingly ignorant or desire, wanting to remain ignorant. Yeah, they've heard it. Yeah, but it hasn't happened to me. I've been doing this for 15, 20 years. Nothing's gone wrong. Tomorrow's another day. Okay. So that's part of the part of the context. And then the other part is, well, if I had to do it, if I somebody came, you know, my boss came down to me tomorrow and said, yeah, hey, we can't, we can't run this risk anymore. I don't know what to do. So because it's not in their wheelhouse, it's never been in their wheelhouse. And and so then if they call in the guy from IT, he just gives us this laundry list of things that are going to have to be done. That's and a different a price tag, And a price tag that just blows their minds. And it creates, um, uh, it stalls the entire effort going forward. But That's but that, the context that's, in my but mind. That, but that's the difference between the, that person's context in the, in the context of BAS versus the IT person's context. Which right. Which is completely different, right? Exactly. Yeah, because in the IT side, they've owned the risk. They recognize their business, whatever it is, cannot afford to go down because they got ransomware or somebody stole somebody's passwords and took over the system. That risk is considered too high to, to not put money at it. So they, put, they, they spend the dollars to do it. And then they look for expertise that can address certain aspects of it. Um, and they get, you know, a lot of, you know, a lot of people get rewarded for their expertise in the area of cyber where IT is concerned. I don't, I know very few people who have been rewarded for their expertise in IT. I mean, in, in the building world for cyber, just a handful, right? So that's the overall context. And that's why it's so dosh, so hard to get people, get building owners off the, 
the, the dime here and get them moving. So, and then of course, Jim Lee always brings up the fact how, how, how services are bought because cybersecurity is a service. It's not a one and done and there's no money for it, even if they start to recognize it. So there's, there's a, it's a hell of a road to, um, to travel right now. That's in my mind, that's the context of what we're facing when we're trying to sell cyber. I think okay. it applies with to what we're doing with analytics as well, right? Yeah. Um, I think the same challenge is we have technology that in the right context, somebody who understands the problem, owns the problem, is looking to improve financial performance. The case is clear, but that person, number one, can you find them? And number two, do they have the organizational power or position to do anything about it, right? And I think that's one of the things we're always trying to do is, is uh, understand where the person you're talking to is coming from. And if there is a context that related to, in, in my case, you know, applying analytics and how it would help them. But I agree, same, same type of uh, thing absolutely applies. And in a way, I think this all ties back to Ken's original point, you know, that we, we need to focus on more on the value, not the technology. The challenge with that is the value is directly related to the context of the person you're talking about. Right. The things have intrinsic value, but that doesn't mean anything if I don't care about it, right? Or I'm not responsible or I don't understand. I don't understand, right, Jeff? That's a big, big factor I see out there is I don't understand. And you're not going to teach them in five minutes. So, so yeah, I think, what you're really on your your point is spot on with respect to analytics and cybersecurity. I think, you know, they are kissing cousins when it comes to understanding the context and who you are, who you need to explain it to depending on, um, you know, the, the person, et cetera. But I guess it's, in, it's having really looked at value for these last couple of weeks because of what, we've been talking about I you know what is the why that's to me I keep coming back to that is is the why when it comes to value of analytics now again is the why value different depending uh depending on the person you're talking to probably same with cybersecurity. but what is our why for these can, can we can we dig can we dig into that um, and take analytics? Part of part of the issue here is that the why is different depending on who you are up and down the stack. Absolutely right. Yeah. So, um, uh, John, can you sort of um, dig into an example of how the context is different between somebody that's, let's say, in the purpose layer versus somebody, let's say, in the data layer? Just from an analytics, just to, to contrast the two, or pick any any two layers. Yeah, well, I, I I I want to focus back on the purpose for a moment. I mean, you know, an initial application of analytics might simply be to collect and analyze and benchmark energy use data. That could be for many organizations we talk to. That is a massive hurdle. They are not there. They don't know in any. Uh, easily available way, what their energy performance is across their portfolio, which ones are high, low, et cetera, and go further, get an interim leader data and understand their patterns, and which could lead to, are you on the right rate? Do you have things happening that are causing demand peaks that could be avoided, et cetera, right? We're not even talking fault detection, right? And one of the things we find is, you know, people um, combine you know, the, these terms. And, and if you say analytics, they think, oh, that means fault detection. No, that's one thing you can do with analytics, right? It's not the only thing. So you often find, hey, I don't need any fault detection. Okay, do you know your energy use and your energy performance? And no, I don't know that. Well, you could use analytics for that. So the purpose, I think, is one of the biggest things we encounter when we're talking to people about how analytics can help them run their buildings more effectively. And notice I said effectively, it might not, it doesn't have to focus on you're going to get energy savings out of this, right? It might be dollar savings and no energy savings if they understand, you know, they're on the wrong rate. Um, when you get down through the stack, you know, the delivery, I think, that, you know, one of the issues there, if we understand is, you know, do I want it as a service or do I want to own it and operate it? 
And we find customers in both camps there regularly. Um, so I'll stop there, I'll let others chime in. Jim, do you want to chime in on analytics up and down the stack? Sure, I, I think that, you know, what I think is most important is value. And when we, when we reach out and look at the personas of these customers, you have, you know, your classical motivators of greed, fear, and regulation. And fundamentally, uh, we might not have this covered on greed because the savings aren't big enough. You know, if you're trying to bring a disruptive technology into a market, people basically say you need an order of magnitude change to do that. We've got 20 or 30 percent. It's real. It's very tangible. Uh, there are other categories of savings that buttress that. So let's say 20 to 30 percent on energy. Uh, other enterprise value propositions uh, in terms of monitoring many of the things John mentioned already. Uh, but it's not an order of magnitude in value. And you know that has trouble disrupting business ecosystems that underlie things. Now, if you look at a lot of the other advantages to what we're working on, a lot of them are societal. And when people try to reap societal rewards, they often do that through regulation, right? I mean, if, uh, if uh, we didn't have regulations on sanitation, we might all just be tossing our trash out in the backyard and having that incinerator barrel out there, right? We wouldn't have fire alarms in our buildings if it wasn't the law to have them in there because they cost money and you know the false alarms are a pain in the backside. However, it does keep people from burning to death. Uh, so you know, we could go on and on with examples like that, but as you look on balance, uh, I think you have to find fundamental motivators. And in, in terms of building analytics, what we're seeing as a real driver is local legislation on a city by city basis, which, which could eventually overcome that potential barrier that we can't overcome on our own because it isn't worth enough. Uh, so let me, let me add some, a couple points to this. If you look at building automation, because that's a term that we've all used to describe what we do. But if you look at what customers are buying versus what they could have bought 40 years ago, they're buying reliable, flexible control over their equipment. They had to have it. They were having it before. They've got it now the same, but it's, it's, it's increasingly reliable because digital is more reliable than say pneumatics. Okay. And it's a lot more flexible because you can go in and you can adjust things on the fly through software. Okay. So, but the, what the context of what people are buying is reliable, flexible control. I, one of the problems I think we have when you go over to analytics at the purpose line and cybersecurity is people don't buy analytics. Hmm. The term itself, cybersecurity, people don't buy cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. They buy risk avoidance in the case of cyber risk. They want to manage their risk. They want to, they want to have operational um, security, if you will. They want stuff to run and not be interrupted by who knows what, right? So I mean, it's why people ha have spare parts on hand in their building in case a, a device craps out, they can, they can immediately replace it. So that's why you do backups. People get the idea that, oh yeah, if my server goes down, I better have a backup somewhere. So if we sell backups, they'll understand that. If you sell them cybersecurity and make it sound like some thing that they don't, they don't understand, maybe we're just emphasizing the words themselves way too much. And instead of just focusing on the things, like what you said, John, people want energy, they want to profile their energy usage. We should be, it doesn't matter how we got there. Yeah, the right. fact that we yeah. use analytics to do it, who cares? Right. Right. Yeah, but Steve, you know, what, what, you've, what you've been talking about are basically capital product buys, the same problem we've all, always talked about. Right. People want the cybersecurity. They just want it to be part of the products that they already bought. And uh, one of the problems is, is that when they bought those products 20 years ago, cybersecurity didn't exist. Yeah problem didn't exist. So the world's changing, the underlying procurement me methodologies and their business ways of thinking about them aren't. And that's the gap we keep getting into. It's a gap 
with analytics. Uh, if you look at building automation, I just had an interesting thought while you were talking, which is it also didn't have a factor of 10 benefit right. of, uh, of uh, going from pneumatic control or mechanical control to DDC. Mm -hmm. There wasn't a factor of 10 value. No, definitely not. not. And what's really interesting is, is that actually is an exception that proves a rule because the adoption of building automation is terrible, right? I mean, we're, we're basically 30 or 40 or 50 years into building automation. We've got a 20% penetration. You know, compare that to a jet engine or a cell phone. Right? That's, a, that's, a, that's a different context though, Jim, just to circle back. So, right. um, but back to your point, Steve, the, the way to epitomize that, the best epitome is obviously um, Edison. He never sold electricity, right? He sold light. Right. His, his whole pitch was selling light and then he, he used electricity to deliver it. Part of our problem, I think, is we keep focusing on the electricity without thinking about, well, um, what am I selling you? Light. Yeah, what are you delivering? Right. That's what really delivering? beautiful. That's really That's beautifully said. And, and Steve, you outlined it. Mark Peacock put it into the chat. Context that matters to you don't mean anything. It's got to matter to the person that it's being right. delivered to. So, boom, right. you just all nailed it. Yeah. And just to circle back to Jim's your point about the BAS, though, uh, you know, I, I'm one of those guys who's old enough to have lived through the pneumatic to electric to DDC to BAS world. Um, I actually, from my experience, the reason that BAS came about was because it was cheaper to put in than the pneumatics stuff was in the day, right? The, the actual mechanical systems of making a mechanical thermostat back in the day was a very expensive proposition. And BAS was more driven by the BAS manufacturers as a cheaper, better, faster approach for the customer than, than to do the pneumatic stuff. It, Beyond that, you know, it produced the same result. You know, in fact, yeah. you know, my thesis yeah. has always been that thermostats could be go back to pneumatic because they work just fine. Yeah. You also got down to one trade instead of two. You had electricians and you got rid of the pipe fitters. Right. Right. So it was much simpler deployment. Yeah. So there was no, yeah, there was no, it wasn't like you were bringing something new like light. To the industry it was just you were doing it in a much more cost effective way effective. yeah you know which was an earth shattering in of itself no, there's nothing not really shattering that bas brought to the equation so can, can we discuss some of these in the context of let's just take the exchange layer we can do any of the other layers if we want so um how do you think about analytics from an exchange perspective or cybersecurity? And how is that different? Uh, you know, if, if somebody that that's Steve Jones, for example, who lives in the exchange layer, right? How how should he be thinking about oh, um, somebody like that? Be thinking about analytics and cybersecurity? Is something that just has to be done as as um, something that needs data. Uh, to me, and the way we look at it is, you don't separate the two. It's two sides of the same coin. It's two sides of the same coin. You don't need the exchange layer unless you're doing all these other things. So two sides to the same coin, my view. Well, I, I think in the context of what Anto was saying, like with Steve Jones, for example, if you had been in the exchange layer forever, so one difference that you would look from an analytics perspective is that if I am transforming the data, because that's really what exchange is about, right? Transforming one protocol to the other. The impact of analytics to me is more now on the meta, right? Before, I didn't really care about the metadata when I transformed from backnet or into the backnet. You know, I just passed through whatever the crap that Johnson gave me and I just passed it on through. Now I should probably be thinking about, should I tag that up as Haystack as it passes through my exchange layer rather than it happening, you know, higher up in the exchange? That would be one impact that I would look at. And Steve, what's your thought about yeah. Cybersecurity. Yeah, so on cybersecurity, take on the exchange layer, you, you start with, from a cyber perspective, you look at, is the data encrypted? That's that, you know, that, that layer you want it encrypted. And so you're exchanging information. So yeah, it's encrypted. Where's it going? So I want to be able to have some kind of network monitoring that tells me source and destination. 
because uh, I, you know, I want to know what's coming in. I want to know what's going out. I want to know where where it is. Okay, so those are good examples of from a cyber cyber perspective, what how the bar gets raised when you start to think about it at the lower layers is for start, you know, you can, and it tends to stack in terms of sophistication, but one of the first things, and that's why they're doing it with BACnet SC is they're encrypting the data. So that even if somebody does get on the wire, at least they can't immediately see what it is. But, uh, but clearly traffic can find its way either from somebody internally routing it outside the building to a place it shouldn't go. That's, that absolutely happens. So, so if you're not monitoring traffic, you're not going to know that that's happened. And that's what happened to, to uh, the Jet Propulsion Lab at, at NASA. Is somebody put a, um, a Raspberry Pi on the network, at one of their engineers. And um, that's how they got into the, and downloaded the plans to the Mars rover. They weren't other monitoring the, the network traffic. Any other thoughts on the exchange layer the, in that context? Or we can move to one of the other layers. Let's take delivery. How is that different from a cybersecurity perspective? That's where things like two-factor authentication, man, uh, mandated two-factor authentication needs to happen kind of thing. Is that is that the right way to think about that? Maybe. I thought delivery was how it's going to be delivered. Software as a service system integrator, sell direct to the owner, or they can glue it on the wall themselves. I thought that that was what we meant by that. So maybe your point is about operation. If I'm going to I'm sorry. be involved with the app, yeah. Yeah. if I'm going to be involved with the app, do I have to go through two, you know, is it set up for two path for authentication or not? Or is it set up for single sign on? So it's all invisible to me, but the IT department has handled that whole security, uh, you know, protocol and methodology so that I don't worry about it as a user, right? Um, so I would say at that level, on the, on the delivery side, you know, I think the context tying into the, the client's interest is, you know, what type of operation they have, but they have the team that's going to do any of these things, analytics, cybersecurity themselves, or they need to outsource it. And, you know, we see, I mean, you read a story that everything's moving to outsourcing, and then you read a story that everything, you know, that things are coming back in-house, right? Everybody's searching for a single answer, but there isn't a single answer, right? Because there isn't a single purpose or a single set of uh, end customer characteristics, right? I was going to ask on the delivery, maybe a question for Bill, and as it relates to cyber, is there a, is there any, uh, do you guys do any requirements on the background checks, you know, or the, the people who are actually doing the actual cyber installation, you know, how do you know you're not bringing in a bunch of uh, Russian hackers as, who are doing the installation for cyber um, and are happily putting uh, Raspberry Pis on your network without, che mm -hmm. without you checking it? You're mute. You're muted, Bill. The answer is a hard no, but look at the people on the call. Look at Fred Gordy and, 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 and Steve Fay. These guys know that like we, we deal in network cybersecurity and all that, but there's so many other, you're, you're referring to physical cybersecurity, but no, we don't do a check on who's buying our stuff. No, absolutely not, man. But there are so many different facets to cybersecurity as Faye has been telling us all for years. Yeah, I was more interested in the people who are actually physically installing the gear and can we trust them in the first place? <laughs> yeah. Physical cybersecurity. I, I don't want to touch that with a 10 foot pole. Thank you. Fair enough. <laughs> so I'm looking at the comment from Michael McMahon. Uh, cybersecurity enables integrity in the whole system. What context is that? Is there in a specific context? Is, is that what? Anybody want to comment on that comment? Enables. Well, I guess, you know, I, I focused on exchange, but I mean, I could, you know, if I move up to the app layer, so every application has, you know, users configured for it. So if you don't manage or administer your users regularly, um, 
you know, people come and go. So you've got to do that. The apps themselves, uh, over time, they security security uh, bugs appear, right? So if you don't maintain your software, then your applications become known to have uh, holes in them, if you will, or, or vulnerabilities. Same with the operating systems that the apps run on. You know, from a from a delivery perspective, um, who's who are the people installing and in, and in, in doing this? Do you even know who who the the companies are that have access to your system? Is that being why is that being controlled in any kind of administrative fashion? So, uh, it, it every layer in that stack, there's there are there's context or there's issues from a cyber perspective that you need to look at. That's that to his Michael's point. It's it's an overall challenge um, for sure, which is why a lot of people run from it because it's it's comp it gets complicated real fast. Which gets back to to the, my point earlier, if you just focus on the word cyber and instead focus on the things that are operationally sort of obvious, like, hey, anybody who's um, gonna come into this thing remotely, I want a Montazi box so that there, there's multi-factor authentication and a secure encrypted pipe. I, I don't even want, I don't even want, don't talk to me about anything other than that minimum level of of quality, right? And then, you know, I, I've got to make sure I've got a backup, right? At all times. Those, I think people can understand that the hardware fails or it could be compromised and I, and I better have a backup. So just, I, I think the more we can focus on a, a simple progressive approach in terms of what we're trying to sell here, uh, the better off we're going to be because we're, we're a crawl stage. That's the way I'm looking at it with both analytics and cyber. We're at the crawl stage, guys. And, yep. and we've got to get people into the market gradually, get them used to it, get them using it in, in basic ways. And then over time, we can add more sophistication to it. I, I really like what Mike yeah. said. So Steve, I really get that. I like what Mike said there. Gina, give me, let me one second here. Okay. What, what Mike's talking about there is it's almost like table stakes. It's like if, you, if you've got cyber handled, like that's table stakes. Now you've brought integrity in the world. Now you can engage the entire world of all the faces on this call of software. It's almost like a Maslow's hierarchy. It's like, you've got to have that first and second <laughs> rung done before you can get up to this building actualization. Table stakes. Yeah. And the only thing I would add to that is just, and I'm reading some of the comments here. And, you know, some of the things that I think that are so important um, and as a provider or manufacturer is to be able to provide um, one is the best practices for how you deploy and how do you utilize. And I think the second thing is, you know, when you look at IT for you to be able to install, you know, Cisco networking gear, router switches, you know, you have to have a CCNA, you have to have that certification, you have to be trained and things like that. And, and, um, I think that's kind of vitally important. And one of the biggest gaps that we have today um, is, is that training, is that best practices um, and requirements going back to, you know, I think Amy put a comment is that um, they absolutely provide security clear clearance on field engineers as requested. But a lot of times, and I've seen this specifically in my past when I've deployed certain types of equipment, um, you know, especially things like wireless um, or an IP based whatever. And a lot of people out there, you know, they, they don't know how to do this. And it's, it's the responsibility of someone who is the provider of those things to make sure that they're equipped with the knowledge uh, to do that. So just, just my little add to that. Well, let's spend some time down here in the systems, in the systems context. Um, and how that plays to analytics and cyber. That's, its role is obviously to supply the data from an analytics perspective, right? In that, in that context, then value is created by, uh, for example, tagging and, uh, uh, as well as the exchange layer. Let me, let me throw a comment out about that, that statement. Okay. It wasn't installed with its role to be to provide data to other applications or systems, which is one of the challenges there that adds 
cost and complexity to properly securing them and also to applying analytics to get value out of them, right? When somebody bought their control system uh, in the last two, three, four, five, ten 10 years, it's unlikely that there was a high degree of focus on this is here to provide data, right, to other applications. I think that's one of the things we're up against, not only, the, not only because are the systems technically capable or how hard is it to do it, but is that even in consideration of the people who are today managing you want to do what to my control? You, you, you need what from my control system? I'm, you know, I'm running the chill. What, what's this guy want, right? You know, it's not part of what their context of their life and responsibility is. That's a big point. Yeah, we run into that one all the time, all the time. You end up dealing with the guy who's like, I'm sorry, I've got lights to change and toilets to clean. What do you need? Uh, what do you, what's this all about, you know? Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, to, when you're talking about it, everything has context, the, the challenge is finding the right context with the right, what's the right message for the right guy, because ultimately there is the right message for that guy who's out there trying to fix something and say, look, if, if, if he doesn't understand what I'm doing, then that's my failure for not providing him the context of what it is I'm trying to do. And if I have an expectation, he's trying to understand it, that's a wrong expectation. You know, that's, I, I shouldn't be doing that. My job is to find what that context is at that point in time for that particular guy, right? Or gal. There you go, baby. Well said. Yeah. And that could be for that particular guy. It could be for your child who's a teenager. It could be yeah. for anything. Well done, man. So just uh, since we're, you want to know what, what I think about it, the systems layer from a cyber perspective, um, I think primarily about, am I prepared when, when the stuff hits the fan? Do I have any kind of a disaster recovery plan? Have I ever even thought about it? Do I know how to put my, my controls into a manual operations? So um, when I don't have a server anymore, because it went down, am I, am I, do I, have I thought about who I'm going to tell my tenants? Do I got communication plans set up? That's typically what goes into a disaster recovery. And did I ever think it might be good to have my activity logs of my users stored somewhere so I could actually see what might have gone, what, how, what might have happened uh, to cause the problem? So that kind of thinking is what goes typically in at that level of the stack from a cyber perspective. And just like analytics, many of those systems that were put in didn't ask those questions 10, 20 years ago. Right. Anybody else want to chime in up and down the stack? Tracy, you've been very quiet. I know. <laughs> you can't get off this easy, Tracy. <laughs> I am trying to um, decide what all this means to us, yeah. right? Great, great. Th there is context to it everything that we do. And, and I, was, I was remembering back to how we got started on this subject to begin with, which is, I think we kind of one day in a conversation identified that, listen, everything that we talk about, every part of the stack is going to need a slightly different message depending on the audience if we ever want to be successful. There is not a one, one thing fits all sort of a message here that we can put out to the industry to magically make all the owners finally adopt technology and in the world as we see it, right? So uh, I'm, tr I'm, I'm trying to reconcile that back to that conversation. What, what does all of this mean, right? So everything has context, everybody, every, situation is going to be a little bit different are, are we here today saying that maybe what we need is to just be conscious of context when we're talking about some of this with an audience um, as we're all out there trying to promote and move this sort of agenda uh, forward or 
or are we just today recognizing that everything, every aspect, every layer of the stack has a different context depending on what who you're I, talking to? I think both, Tracy. Be aware well, of it at all times, and it's everywhere. So yeah, I think awareness is a great first step, and then you break it down into the different stacks or whatever it is you're dealing with. So and, in fact, I'd go, I'd go one step further. I think if you just think about it for a moment, you know what, a year ago, without the stack to have this conversation would have been meaningless, right? Because we would have been all over the map, right? Because we would have been talking about smart buildings and we're trying to provide context and I'd be off in one direction, John in another way and Jim. Mm -hmm. and I think if nothing else, the stack at least has starting to give us a, I, yeah, to answer the question, well, who am I talking to? What's important to you? Okay, you live down here. Here's your context. Here's what I'm trying to talk. And here's the message that I'm trying to deliver. But I've actually think as a result of that, we've come a long way, um, you know, to at least have a break down the conversation into what is relevant and what's not relevant. Whereas if we were just trying to have this conversation about smart buildings, I would have no idea how that would go now, to be honest. <laughs> here's the the tricky part is I was listening to everybody talk and and I I was pretty much in agreement with the areas that I kind of had any reason to know anything but to me we've we've identified a few really critical things one is there's context to every as every layer of the stack depends on the situation who you're talking to what needs to be said and what's important uh, everybody has a slightly different need and they look at the world differently. Our customers look at the world different, differently. They need lights, not electricity. Um, so I'm, I'm, I was trying to get to a, so now what? An answer. I was trying to get to an answer, I guess. What do we do with this? So we've identified all of this. What, what can we do as a group here to sort of move this all forward now in a better way? And the answer is? That's why I didn't say anything. I, <laughs> I, I, I will, Tracy, I'm going to give you an answer that you might not like. Recognizing that the fish in water is the biggest part of the deal. Recognize that we've got to like contemplate each conversation differently. We'll mm -hmm. take the people on this call much farther along. That's my answer. It, it, yeah. it is. You know, you just reminded me of something, right? You use different bait with every fish you go fishing for, right? You grow plants differently depending on the type of plant they are. You hunt animals with different techniques. When it comes to getting the world to move in our direction, I think it's maybe as simple as, as that, is just knowing your audience and understanding that there's they're going to have a different contextual point of view uh, depending on who they are, what they own, what they're, reason for their position is whatever it might be right we kind of hit on a bunch of them today and and you have to be cognizant of that or you're going to be we collectively are going to be unsuccessful as an industry moving our agenda it, we're going to be having the same conversation in 20 years again right how do we avoid that the <laughs> problem we i see about... tracy with that is just the vast dynamism of that customer base it's not a static thing that we're looking at. It's changing enormously quickly now. And that makes it really yeah. hard. Just look at the matrix of, you know, the, the number of combinations of context versus, uh, you know, applied to the stack is endless nearly, right? So, um, so, so can it be said that we were talking about table stakes earlier in a different context? <laughs> Can it be said that understanding this con the different contexts up and down the, the stack is for us as an industry table stakes? If we can't do that, then we're going to fail. 100%. Yep. Yeah. And that, that was back to my point of at least creating the stack is, is a, one of the steps on that path, right? Because without it, we would, we have nothing, we, we have no starting point. At least we've broken it down and now, you know, now we've got something to to talk about and around that has 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 meaning. Yeah, and that, I mean, what I'm looking for is a, a path forward to success. Right? We've identified we have problems and issues. We've identified the complexity of our 
problems and issues. We're all pretty smart people. How can we create something that helps us move through that uh, dynamic marketplace a little bit easier? Yeah, I've been put, uh, beating on this communication of change. And I think what I've learned from today's session is that context has is a big part of that. And maybe it is engage in the context of communication or the communication context of change. Uh, it's, it's such an integral part of it. And I think it's even more important right now because we're all going so many different directions and having so many experiences with so many uh, people that are going different directions. We really need to frame our, our communication and the context of our communication. So I'll try and uh, beat that into some of my areas. Beautiful. Great. That's a great place to stop in my view, Anto. Yeah, that's great. Uh, this has been a great conversation. We're uh, past the top of the hour, so let's wrap it here. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for, uh, for all the comments. And uh, video will be up tomorrow-ish. And uh, have a great week. Bye-bye, everybody. Okay. Thanks, Bye. you guys. Bye. Great job, you guys. Bye. Yep.